space. You can't tell me yeah. that they really think going into next year with Koskinen and for some reason, one and a half million dollars of 80 million year old Mike Smith is a I good idea. I think it was idea. two million. It was two million. Yeah. You got more than $2 Lundqvist. Million. Like, I mean, come on. And also, I mean, I can't, I can't see why Edmonton would have done that deal, but maybe because Mike Smith said, well, Lundqvist is even off the market, so we'll grind you on this one. I'm pretty um, sure for them it was either it was either going to be Mike Smith or Ryan Miller were their two options at the end, and they went with the known commodity who was there last year. So, I then then yes. you know that you got you can't think if you're them that that's going to be it, right? Like they must think that there might be some trade options out there. They they got to be looking to upgrade that spot. Yeah, and I think that they think they can do it during the season too. Maybe like that that it doesn't necessarily have to be something that happens in October 2020. It's the only part of their – I actually think with little cap space, they did a pretty good job to dress some of their holes. Yeah. They need better defensive players. I think we would all agree there. But they also lost their power play quarterback in, in, in the cleft bomb. And so, you know, getting Tyson Berry is not a bad power play option for them. He just has to be sheltered a little bit at five on five. But well, I, I like what they Tyson- did with, with no cap. They have no cap room. They got everybody cheap. They got everyone on good market value contracts. Th- that's the confusing thing about Tyson Berry, though, just because I, I want to talk about that for a second. Because first off, you know, what we saw in Toronto with Tyson Berry, I don't think is completely fair. I think, you know, you had 20 games of Mike Babcock being a stubborn ass, basically. Uh, he And then, you know, and the team was then really good for the next 20 games, 25 games. The keep was the coach. And then they kind of went into their... January, February, kind of blase, and then we had had COVID. It was a weird, weird year, and I don't think the criticism, all of it, of Tyson Berry is fair. However, he was lauded as the the solution at right-handed D, and and certainly was not the full solution. Still had a pretty good year. Um, he was offered almost double in Vancouver. Apparently, what he got in Edmonton, he get he gets three point seven five million to play with McDavid on the power play. Um, he was apparently offered something close to 6 million in Vancouver. I'm not sure if you can confirm that, but that was, those are the reports we're reading. Um, Vancouver's got a good team. <laughs> why, why, why not that? And why not more money? Is it that he thinks, Hey, I get to play with Connor McDavid on the power play and I'm going to make a boatload of cash next year. I think he understands after the Toronto experience that fit is, is probably as important as anything for a player. And this doesn't just apply to him, but he's got to play somewhere where he's the number one power play guy at this point in his career. I, I just don't think he's, He's not giving you enough value. I mean, that's what he's good at. And, and I think the source of his issues in Toronto honestly started with the fact that he was on the second power play and the Leafs had a killer first power play, uh, you know, so they do not get the second power play, you know, doesn't even get on the ice much in Toronto. And, and that started him off on the wrong foot with the Leafs and with Babcock. And, and I just don't, I mean, he's, he's look, he still put together a pretty good bad season for himself, <laughs> you know, all things considered, but you know, I just think it never got off to the right start there. And, and if you're going to go sign with a team that is Quinn Hughes, unless they're using two defensemen on the power play, you're not getting on the first power play. Right. And so I think he understood that finding the right situation to, to, to flourish and show his best made sense. It's why he had to leave Denver, right? Kale McCarr came along and stole his job at the end of that one season. And, and it kind of made him redundant there in a sense. And so he's right. almost a little bit of a specialist type of player with what he does well, because what he does well is he does really, really well. And, and so, you know, in Edmonton, they're going to play the crap out of him when it's five on four. And I think they're going to try to to protect him at five on five. And and if they find the right mix and if, you know, I, I think he can be very successful doing that. And I think he understands that better. That was his lesson from Toronto. It was a, it's hard to play somewhere new after being in Denver so long where he was very comfortable and was, I mean, Tyson Berry is one of the best guys you could ever meet in the NHL, quite honestly. He's a super guy. And it just – it didn't go well in Toronto. I think he learned some lessons from that, and that informed his decisions he made on, on free agency day. And to, to give you an idea, by the way, uh, you know, in terms of situation and what a difference it made, uh, I tweeted this the other day. Barry under Babcock, uh, zero goals, seven assists, seven points in 23 games, which is a 25-point pace over an 82-game season. Barry under Keefe, five goals – I think he scored, what was it, three or four straight games? Five goals, 27 assists, 32 points in 47 games, which is a 56-point pace. That's and he scored good. the first goal of the season the very first night when Keith took over in, in, in yeah. Arizona. And then he oh, scored oh, the I remember that. Game, and the return to Colorado. The next, very next game was his return to Colorado. He scored there. Like yep. It was like literally like turning a light switch the, the minute the coaching change was made. And, and 
Look, I'm not going to blame Babcock exclusively because, you know, Morgan Riley is to me a legitimate power play one guy. Like I don't, I don't yeah. think it was, I don't think it was insane, but what it was, it was reflective of a front office and a, and a coaching staff that wasn't totally in, in tune, which we've all kicked around enough over the years. 100%. So, you know, uh, I mean, really with Edmondson, it seems like they, you know, they, they made a really, uh, I think one of the better moves of the day, which was Kyle Turris. Um, that is a, to me, uh, I, I, I know that people didn't like Kyle Turris based on his production versus salary, but if Ty- Kyle Turris can give you what he gave you last year in Nashville at the money he's going to be making, which I think is in the neighborhood of one and a half million dollars. Uh, yeah. One six five, uh, I think. One six five. And this is a guy that, I mean, 30 or 40 points for one six five is, I don't know, pretty good in my books, uh, especially for a player who is trying to prove himself and trying to prove he still belongs. He's 31 years old. Yeah. 31 points last year. So, you know, there's a, a playmaking option. What do you think of that deal? And what do you think about his fit? Because that's going to be really important. It wasn't a fit in Nashville pretty much from the beginning for Kyle Torres. Yeah. You know, he did have a really good first year there and the Predators had a good first year. It just didn't end up with the Stanley cup. And then, right for a whole bunch of reasons, their team is kind of, I wouldn't say completely falling apart, but they certainly haven't, they, they didn't take the steps that everyone was projecting for them. Um, and so Kyle Dur- Turris is a bit of a victim of that. Obviously he's got to own his own performance too, but you know, I think he was scapegoated a little bit. He had some injury issues there and he signed a big contract and he didn't live up to it. So, you know, th- again, it's a harsh business. He gets bought out, but I think when you're looking at him on a one-year deal, uh, and, and not making much money. I mean, it's a no brainer to me. He's still young enough and he's, he's played for Dave Tippett before in Arizona. I just think that he'll be much more comfortable. I think the expectations will be reasonable. And remember, he's going to play behind some version of McDavid dry and Ryan Nugent Hopkins as the other centers. I mean, he's their fourth line center, or I guess if they're using dry or someone on the wing, he's their third line center, but you know, you're, you're not asking a ton from him. Yeah. You know, he's probably getting some power play two time. Um, but, you know, I think at this point in his career, I, I, I like the signing and, you know, good for Edmonton. It's a place that, that kind of is the butt of some unfair jokes. I think at times I actually just spent a month there and it was awesome to be there in September. I mean, I, I've only ever visited during hockey season in the past and it's usually minus 30, but to be there when it's like 15 degrees Celsius and gorgeous, there's gorgeous. like great, great running trails. And it was, it's, a, it's actually, I just say it, it's a low key. It's, it's a better spot than I think it's given credit for and good for them for landing some free agents and, Look, that, that team should get better at some point. I mean, if, if we're cheering for teams, if we're cheering for Buffalo, I think we should be cheering for Edmonton too, honestly, with the, the best player in the game to, to you know actually get to show himself on the biggest stages. If you have Kyle Turris as your third line center, how do you not run McDavid Dreisaitl every game together? Like you've got Nuge. What does it matter? If you've got, a, if you've got 240 or 250 points on one line, what does it matter? As long as the other guys are playable, like you, you're talking about, you know, guys that could do 120 points together easily, those two. Right. And, and look, I think what Edmonton's going to look at is, is better defensive play. I mean, they don't need more goals. It's actually, it's a lot like the Leafs. Like any discussion about the Leafs shouldn't be, how do you make this team score more? Or how can you make the third line more dangerous? It's more about how do you, can you build a team and to support the superstars? Because, you know, Tampa is the best example of this for teams like Edmonton, Toronto. You, you don't have to win 7-6. And I'm also not arguing that you got to win 2-1. But when you have the offensive power they, they do at the top of the lineup, I think how the bottom of the lineup is built and constructed is really important. And, you know, Kyle Turris himself doesn't always have the best defensive metrics. He did a couple of years ago. You know, we'll see if he can rebuild himself. But I think put in the right role with the right understanding, you know, that that team can become more maybe more complete at the, the bottom half to support those top players.